Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve perfect squares. This is going to be a dynamic programming problem and it's pretty similar to the problem coin change which I've already solved and I would say that this is a very similar problem to coin change. It's nearly identical actually. So we're given an integer n. We want to know what's the least number of perfect squares that can sum to this number n. So basically the difference between coin change and this, in coin change we're given an arbitrary number of coins with certain values. With this we're only allowed to use perfect squares to sum up to the value n. And if you don't recall, a perfect square is just basically a number that has been squared. So for example, an integer 1 squared is going to end up being 1, integer 2 squared is going to end up being 4, integer 3 squared is going to end up being 9, so on and so on and so on, right? So they give us a couple examples n equals 12, minimum number of perfect squares is going to be 3, 4 plus 4 plus 4, that's 3, 13 is going to be 9 plus 4, so that's 2 perfect squares needed. So your first idea is probably going to be, can you just be greedy, right? Like, can you just take, for example, 12, what's the largest perfect square that's less than or equal to 12, right? Because if we had, like, for example, 5 squared, right, that's going to be 25. That's too big, right? That's not going to sum up to 12 ever. But let's start with the largest perfect square that does. Does 4 squared? That's going to be 16. That's still too big. Then we go to 3 squared. That's 9, right? So we're starting with the biggest perfect square that's available to us that's less than or equal to 12, right? And so now what we're going to do is we're going to try 2 squared, right? 2 squared is 4, right? So 4 plus 9 is going to end up being 13, right? So we went too far, right? We're trying to get 12. We went too far, right? But I wrote down over here, if we started being greedy, right? We started with the biggest one, 3 squared, and then we'd get these values, 1 squared, 1 squared, 1 squared, is the only way we're going to be able to sum to 12. But we notice if we're not greedy, if we start with 2 squared, for example, that's going to be 4. We get another 2 squared that's going to be plus 4. Another 2 squared is going to be plus 4, and that's going to be 12, right? Notice how with this approach, which was not greedy, we did not start with the largest perfect squares but we were able to get it in three perfect squares, whereas when we were greedy over here, we had four. So this is not a greedy problem. This is a dynamic programming problem. And I'm gonna show you how you can work your way from the brute force solution to the dynamic programming solution, which is going to be pretty efficient. So what's the brute force approach? Usually with dynamic programming problems, usually a brute force approach is always going to be a decision tree. So let's say we start out with our sum being zero, right? Of course, we want our sum to be 12, but initially we're zero. So we have a few branches that we can take. We can start with one squared, right? That's one perfect square we could choose. We could start with two squared. That's another perfect square we could take. We could try 3 squared, which is another perfect square. And then we would be sequential, right? We'd go 1, 2, 3, 4, and just keep going like that until we get to 4 squared, right? What does 4 squared lead us to? That leads us to a sum of 16. So clearly we went too big, right? 16 is greater than 12. We went too large, so this is not going to be the path we take. So once we get to this point, we can just stop immediately. We're not going to continue down this path. But with these other three, we'll get a sum of 1, of 4, of 9. And so I'm not going to draw the entire decision tree, but that's basically what it would be, right? So from this 1, we would also have, you know, the same three choices, 1 squared, 2 squared, and 3 squared. And that would lead us to sums of 2, uh, 4 plus 1 is going to be 5, 9 plus 1 is going to be 10. So these would be our sums so far. And basically you can tell, for example, we got to the sum 10, right? It took us two perfect squares, a 1 squared and a 3 squared to get to this, right? So basically the height of this portion is going to be the number of perfect squares it took us to get here. And the thing you're going to notice with this decision tree is that there's going to be a lot of repeated work. For example, from here, if we took a 1 squared, right, then we'd get 5 again, right? But we see that there's already a 5 over here, and now we have another 5 over here. So there's going to be a lot of repeated work in this decision tree. And remember, our ultimate goal is to get to this sum, n equals 12, right? 
And so each of these values, right, 10 tells us so far we're at 10. Our goal is to get to 12, but so far we're at 10. Here we're at five, here we're also at five, right? So do we really need to continue down both of these paths? Because from here, we can see that it took us two perfect squares to get here. From here, it also took us two perfect squares to get here. And from here, what we're now trying to determine is if we start at five, how many perfect squares does it take us to get to 12? From the original root, we were trying to determine from zero how many perfect squares does it take for us to get to 12. Or thinking about the problem in a different way, once our sum is five, in reality from here on, we're really looking for what's the minimum number of perfect squares, not what it takes to get to 12 because we've already gotten to five, but right now we just want a plus seven to add to this five so that we can get to 12, right? Because when you look at the decision tree, because we've found that to get to five, the minimum number of perfect squares it takes is two. And so we want to know from here, what's the minimum number of perfect squares does it take to get to seven? Then we can see if this is a possible solution. But of course, we know that the actual answer is going to be a different path. It's going to be from here, where we take another two squared and we get to a total of eight. And so from here, we're looking for what's the minimum number. So we have eight now, right? So we're looking for eight plus four four is what's going to give us 12. So at this point, what we're looking for is what is the minimum number of perfect squares does it take for us to get to the total of four? And we know that there exists a perfect square that exactly matches four, right? We know two squared is equal to four. So how many perfect squares does it take to get to four? It takes exactly one perfect square. So we know that that's actually just a given, right? It takes a single perfect square. So then we can see that in total, it'll with this path, it'll take the minimum number of perfect squares will be three. So let's now try to actually formulate what, what exactly is the sub problem in this case. So we know we tried, we started at one, two, three, four, and we just went arbitrarily high until we got to a value four where four squared was 16 and that was too large than this, right? So in reality, we had exactly three choices, one, four, and nine. These were our sums initially. So along this path, we actually took this n equals 12 and changed the sub problem to actually n equals 11 because we know we've gotten a sum of one so far. We want to know what's the minimum number of perfect squares does it take to get to 11. For this one, we want to know what's the minimum number of perfect squares does it take to get to eight, right? Because eight plus four is going to lead us to 12. For this one, we want to know what's the perfect number of squares does it take to get to three. So basically, we're taking this big problem n equals 12 and breaking it down into three sub problems, right? So whichever one of these yields the minimum number of perfect squares, that's going to be our solution. And so what we're going to be doing here is we're going to continue to be breaking these down into sub problems until we get to the base case, which of course is going to be n equals zero, right? How many perfect squares does it take to sum to zero? Of course, that's going to also end up being zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to start bottom up because we see that a big problem like 12 is going to depend on smaller sub problems like 11, 8, and 3. We don't know which ones it's going to be. It could be any of them that are smaller than n, so anything less than n. And even three is also going to have sub problems, right? So before we want to solve n equals three, we're going to need to solve n equals two, n equals one. And the base case is just going to be n equals zero, which we don't need to solve. So this is going to be the bottom up approach. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be computing the minimum number of perfect squares starting at n equals one, then going to two, then going to three until all the way we get to 12. And for each of these sub problems, right, let's say instead of doing 12, we were doing n equals five, I'm going to make this same kind of decision. Like I'm going to make, I'm going to try every single possible perfect square. So one square, two squared, just, just like how we stopped early here. Like once we got to a number 16, that was bigger than our n that we were looking for. That's how we're going to stop for the sub problems as well. So for example, five, we see that one squared is going to be one 
2 squared is going to be 4, 3 squared is going to be 9, so we're going to stop early here. We're not even going to get to this 4 squared 16 position. So with that being said, what's going to be the time complexity of this? Because we can tell that there's going to be a nested loop, right? We're going to be going, since we're going to be starting at 1 and going all the way to n, which in this case is obviously 12. So that's going to be big O of n, right? And for each of these n values, we're going to have this original layer, like this first layer of the decision tree, only a single layer, right? But how big is this layer going to be? Well, it depends on the value n, right? But we know it's definitely bounded by at least the square root of n, right? Because remember, we're stopping once we get equal to or greater than our n value, right? So we're going to start at 1, then go to 2, then go to 3, and eventually we'll get to either the square root of this, right? In this case, 12 doesn't really have a square root integer. It'll be 3 point something, right? But for example, if, if instead of being 12, this was 16, we would do 1 squared, right? 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, which is exactly 16, and then we would stop, right? So we're stopping at this value, which is the square root of 16, right? So this the overall time complexity is going to be bounded by n times the square root of n. With that being said, let's jump into the code. It's pretty short. So like I said, we're going to be solving all these subproblems before we solve the original n problem. So I'm going to have a DP array where we store the result of those subproblems. I'm going to initialize every value just to n. You could do max integer if you wanted, but we know that for n, the max number of possible squares is, is going to be at the at most n because, you know, at the very least, we could do 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared and then eventually get to that sum n that we're looking for, that target value. And so the size of this is going to be, we're going from 0 to n, so the size is going to be n plus 1. And remember the base case is going to be where the target value is 0. We know that that takes 0 squares to get to that target value. So we're going to be iterating through every target value in the range of 1 all the way to n. In Python, n plus 1 is non-inclusive, so this is going to stop. The last iteration is going to be n. And we're going to be going through every single possible square value. So s in range from 1 to the target value plus 1 because this is non-inclusive. This is not the actual square value. This is just we're going through every value from 1 to the target. But we're going to be using s to compute the square. So s times n is going to be the square, right? We're going from 1, 2, 3, 4. But we know if we go over, for example, if target subtracted by the square is less than 0, that's when we're going to break, right? That's when we can stop early. We can stop short. We don't need to continue. We don't need to waste our time. But if we don't stop short, that's where we're going to compute the possible solution. So we're going to say for dp of target, a possible solution could be the minimum of what it already is, right? In that case, there would be no change or the minimum of the remaining amount. So for example, target minus square, right? So let's say our target was 12, our square was 4. Now the new value that we're looking for is 12 minus 4, so we're looking for 8, right? So we're going to say dp of target subtracted by square, right? That's why we're solving this from 1 all the way up to n, because we're, we're depending on the smaller results. That's why it's called bottom up. But this also needs an additional one because we just used a square. Remember, what we're trying to do is counting the number of minimum squares. We just used a single square. So one plus whatever the, the minimum number of squares it takes to compute this new amount, right? 12 minus four. How many minimum squares does it take to get to eight plus, you know, the single square that we just used right now? And once that is done, we'll have gone through every single target value, 1 all the way to n. So therefore, the, the solution to n will be stored in our DP array. So then we can just return that. Return DP at position n. That's going to be the minimum number of squares it takes to get to n. So remember, the overall time complexity of this is big O n multiplied by square root of n. 
you can kind of write that like this. There's not a good way to do it, but yeah, that's the time complexity. There is a more efficient way to solve this problem, but this is kind of the main solution that I think an interviewer would look for. Like this is the actual intuitive solution. There are like more mathematical solutions that I don't know if, you know, that would actually be helpful to learn, but I hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot and I'll hopefully see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.